Good morning. It's great to have you with us, especially on Baptism Sunday. It's so fun to celebrate at all of our campuses, are experiencing baptisms today, so it's so much fun. And again, we want to welcome you if you're a guest. We hope that we get a couple of moments to just connect with you after the service. Uh, but just to kind of set this up, for those of you that maybe haven't been with us over the last few weeks, uh, we are in a series called Slay a Dragon. Now, there's this dragon that a lot of us have on our back, and it is devouring every spare penny that we've got. And so we've been talking over the last few weeks about how to slay that dragon. And we've been doing a thing called Financial Peace University, and we have over 180 people that are participating in Financial Peace University. We did a survey of those in the Financial Peace, and in that, there's over $5.2 million of debt amongst those who are in Financial Peace, and that does not count mortgages. So when we talk about this, you know, it's, it's a big number, but I want you to understand if you're a guest with us, I want to ask you for some grace as we kind of talk a little bit about money today. And we're not talking about the church's money. We're talking about your money. And the reason why we're doing that is if you haven't been with us before, we often receive our tithing offering at the end after the whole sermon's done. And so we've been doing that before the sermon because we don't want you to feel like we're trying to manipulate your pocketbook. All right. Everybody say amen. All right, I mean, so I just want to be upfront and honest with you about it, that we're having that conversation a little bit about money, but I, I hope that this kind of just goes into the depth of your heart today. Now, if we look around, we can turn on the news, we can talk to people, and what we see often is businesses are closing all around us. It seems a little bit surreal here in Rapid even. And so when we're seeing this over and over again, we can ask our quest ask questions. Why are businesses closing? Well, sometimes it's because of something that just, it was negligence. It was just poor management. Sometimes it was something nefarious, you know, what you typically see on the news and somebody makes a big story about. But no matter what it is, we see these things closing all around us. Now, if we could take that perspective and Bring it in home personally. If I, I want you to imagine that you're the bookkeeper of a company called U Inc. Y O U. You're the bookkeeper. You keep the finances, you manage, you do a lot of management of this business. And if we were to kind of take a step back and you could step away from your shoes and you were to look at your life and you looked at the bookkeeper of U Inc., would you fire them? That's a big question to ask, and that's a question that maybe all of us should ask of ourselves, not just of other businesses, well, I'd fire that person, but would we look at that and ask ourselves the question for us personally? See, we're talking about the question of ownership and management. We're talking about the idea of am I an owner, am I a manager, what am I? At the end of the day, no matter how much cash we have in the bank or how much we owe to Visa, we have the understand that we are managers of someone else's money. We have to come to an understanding and revelation that we're the manager of someone else's money. The truth is, is that we do work for you, Inc., Y-O-U, but there's somebody who is over us in our lives. And I want you to guess who the owner is. God. His name is God. We refer to him as the Father. I mean, we have many great things that we call him the great I am. If you look through scripture, there's all these names for our boss. See, he's the boss. He's, he's the one who's the owner of you and I, especially when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as we step towards him, we've got to understand that we're simply the manager of what he's entrusted us with. God is the owner, and we're called to manage God's money. I want to read this psalm to you, Psalm 24, verse 1. It's a psalm of David. It says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. God's the owner, period. That's it. That's all. But you might be hearing this, and you might think a couple words. This isn't God's money in my wallet. It's my money. I worked for it. I earned it. I deserve it. I know I've said that to God. Just me? Okay. All right. Just... <laughs> And just, sorry, confessional moment there. I mean, I, I've, I've said that to God. I've shouted that at God. I've shaken my fist at God. But trust me, that's not the first time God's heard this opinion. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you want to slowly make your way there, we're going to camp out there for a little bit in Deuteronomy chapter 8. But Moses relates God's commands to the wandering nation of Israel. And in this, the Lord had brought them out of slavery and was taking care of them in every need. I love the story that we read about as, as how God took care of the people. He was providing food every morning. He was protecting and blessing them in battle, and he was ultimately leading them to the promised land. 
However, the nation continued to gripe. Everybody say gripe. gripe. And complain all the time. Honestly, they were, they were a little full of themselves. And we tend to gripe and complain when we get full of ourselves. At least I do. In Deuteronomy 8, I want you to grab your Bibles, and we're going to look at specifically at verse 10 and a little bit further down. But we see a warning that rings just as true to us today as it did to the Israelites then. Deuteronomy 8, verse 10. Let me read it to you. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. It starts with some great advice. When you are satisfied and content, your first reaction is to thank God. That should be the first reaction. We're used to thanking God for a meal, but do we thank God for our paychecks? I, I, I have to be honest with you. There's been seasons of my life where I think, I earned that, I worked hard for that, that's what I have in my pocket, that's how I got there. But how often do I thank God for the paycheck that I've received? Deuteronomy 8, and now let's go down to verse 11. Take care, lest you forget ooh, the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You know, we sing songs about, you know, thanking God in the valley, thinking, and I love what Pastor Keith was leading us in, is thinking about, you know, uh, I mean, when I'm in the gutter, God's with me there. I mean, we, we can thank God. Uh, we tend to lean into God more in those seasons of our life. But when we're on top of mountains and we're celebrating and, and everything's good and our bills are paid and we've got more than enough in our pocket and all that's happening, sometimes we get a little bit full of ourselves and we, for think, we forget to thank God for it. Many people find it easier to praise God in suffering, but not so much in success. Success often blinds us to God's provisions. Let me say that again. Success often blinds us from God's provisions. See, God has provided everything that you have. No matter how much you think it is or how little you think it is, he's provided it for you. Success lulls us into a false sense of self-sufficiency. It lulls me into a place of like, I'm good. I got this handled. But verse 14 issues a solemn warning that we can't ignore. If we keep our eyes on our accomplishments, then our hearts become proud. Everybody say proud. proud. See, the indictment of pride is a serious offense because in pride, we believe we got here. In pride, we believe we got ourselves to this place. In pride, we think that I earned this, I've worked for it, it's mine, all mine. Now let's go a little further. Deuteronomy 8, verse 15. Who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness. He's going on to declare what God's done. With its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground there, where there was no water. Who brought you water out of the flinty rock. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna from your fathers that your fathers did not know. That he might humble you and test you and do you good in the end. Those of you who aren't familiar with the story, God miraculously provides for the Israelites. We're talking over a million people in the middle of the wilderness. God provides manna, he provides quail, he provides water, he provides all these incredible things and feeds this many people. This passage drives home the point though that God has done the work. God has done the work. The overriding theme in this verse is very clear. God did it. And the minute you say you did it, you better think again. I know there's times in my seasons of my life where I've thought, I did this, and I've been quick to feel the pressure and the presence of God say, no, 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 wait a second, kid. <laughs> I did this. Verse 17. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me in this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. 
Verse 17 says that the most of us think what we mostly think in our triumphs. My power, my strength got me here. My power, my strength got me this wealth. It's kind of quiet in here, I know this, but this is really the battle of the American mindset, is that we live in a place where this, we're, to, we're to work hard, we're to strive for something, we're to set goals, and, and those are all wonderful, and they're great to have them, but the second that we get outside of God and recognize that he's the one that's given us the ability to get there, we're in trouble. Amen. Verse 18 tells us the antidote we're called to remember the Lord because he is the one who gives us the ability to produce wealth. The anecdote to your pride, the anecdote to how you are acting and how you're feeling inside, the anecdote is that you are declaring, no, no, God brought me to this place. God gave me this ability. Amen? Amen. I think sometimes, though, we forget that he owns it all. He owns everything. We forget in our society today that God owns it all. The Bible says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, we struggle to understand that, especially if we're not a rancher. But I'll tell you this, that everything that you have that's been put in your hand at this point in life, it's because God put it there. And when you can live with that kind of mindset, it'll change what happens in your life. I truly believe that. See, there's a verse here in Proverbs that really is something practical that we should live by that helps us move towards recognizing that God owns it all. Proverbs 3.9, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits of all your produce. See, listen, what happens is because we don't, a lot of us, you know, we might have a garden, but we don't, farm anymore so much. We don't ranch. Maybe there's not a lot of ranchers in this room today, but listen, everything we have is, is a gift from God. And what happens is, is the way we combat that selfishness and that, that, that pride that says we're self-sufficient is we actively put God first. We declare that he's the owner. I, I will just share with you the way that I've learned it, to share and put God first and declare that he's the owner of everything in my life is I give him my first fruits. And so when you harvest an apple tree, you're giving him the first apple. There, there's something to be said about saying, God, I'm going to put you first. In, in those kind of actions, when you get up in the morning, I'm going to give you the first of my time. It, let me put it this way for you, all right? You invite me to your birthday party, okay? All right? Say yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm expecting an invite now. All right, so I'm going to get invited to your birthday party. And you got this big birthday cake. And, they, and this is what you do. You say, uh, would you cut the cake? Yes, I will cut the cake. So I cut the cake for you. And instead of giving you the first piece, I give myself the first piece. <laughs> You're just like, whoa, excuse me? And then I cut another piece. And instead of giving it to you, I give it to somebody else at the party. And then and I cut another piece. And instead of giving it to you, I, I give it to somebody else at the party. And that's what we do with God. Over and over again in our lives, we take our birthday cake and we start handing it out to everybody else and we've never acknowledged the one who has given it to us. So I want to illustrate this with you. I have a simple illustration, but this illustration is something that will hopefully help you grab a hold of the idea that everything that passes through your hands first goes to God. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of illustrate this. I'm going to show you something. This is, this is God's table. Ever say God's table. Okay, say my table. my table. All right, so this is your table. This is God's table. And what happens is, is when we start to live our lives where we really truly believe that everything that we have is because of God. So when I get a sack of potatoes, how many like potatoes? Or at least French fries, right? Okay. So when I get a sack of potatoes, let's say I'm going to get 10. But here's the deal. I'm going to actively put God first. I'm going to declare that he's the owner. All right, so here's God's potatoes. I'm going to give this to him. These are his potatoes but those are my potatoes. And so, I mean, it's, it's winter. I mean, you need some citrus in your life. You need something to cheer you up, right? You know, in the cold weather. So if I'm gonna take some, I'm gonna take some tangerines, all right, the reality is, is that these are my first ones. I'm gonna go ahead and give these to God first. So I set that aside. 
See, I'm, I'm actively putting first fruits. I'm saying, God, you're number one, all right? And I mean, how many would not love to be in a place where these are grown right now? Anybody? <laughs> this room, the side of the room, yes. This side of the room is like, no, I love it in the Arctic. It's wonderful. I mean, but this is what God does. So when I, when I, get, when I get something into my hands, what happens is I have a choice. Am I going to give God the first? Well, I'm going to work on that. So as I do that, the reality is, is when I give God the first thing, I start to recognize and realize, do you see the difference here between God's table and my table? See, what happens is, is every time I get something that's put in my hands, the question is, what will I do with it? But if I put God first and I say, God, you're the first, you're the best in my life. When I start doing that, the reality is I'm declaring, God, you are number one and you own it all. See, we get so worried. Our mindset shifts and we think, well, you know what? God doesn't know what I own at all because I can't be generous with what I have in life because if I am generous with what I have in life, there was not going to be enough left over for me. Anybody think that? I know I have. I have thought that before where, you know what, There's, I, I, I'm probably not going to have enough left over for me. But the reality is, is that when I start living by the mindset that God owns it all and I start putting him first in everything that I've got and I say, God, you're number one, I, I'm telling you, his table looks different than our table. And he gave us the ability to see this. But rarely. Are you getting the point here? Okay. See, what happens is, is that we often think, well, I don't know if there's enough for me, God. I don't know. But when we start declaring that he owns it all, what happens is he starts changing our lives. And the thing is, it even happens in our time. What if you got up in the morning and you said, God, I'm giving you the first and the best of my day. See, when I give you the first and the best of my day, it's almost like there's more margin in my time. It's almost like there's more to declare. And the reality is, too, is, is we all have talents. This is not one of mine, but, <laughs> but we all have talent. And the thing is, is whether it's what's put in our hands, the produce of life, our money that's in our pocket, or it's the time that God has given us in this life, or it's our talent that we have, when we begin to live our lives and say, God, you own all of this. So therefore, I'm going to put you first. I'm going to declare that you're the best. I'm going to declare that you own it all, and everything that's been put in my hands, I'll just be a good manager of. We get so scared that we won't have enough left over for us. But when we put God first, this is all he's asking for. This is what our table looks like. This is what our lives look like. It's a principle that he's laid down all throughout scripture. He owns it all. And if we live this way, I'm telling you, your life would be revolutionary. I'm still learning to live this way. I have not arrived. But on days like today, I'm reminded. On days like today, when somebody's baptized and says to the world, I'm a follower of Jesus, it's because they recognize that God owns it all, even my life. And God owns everything that's ever been put in my hands. And all he asks is for us to symbolically put him first by giving him the first and the best. And in that lifestyle, Look what's left for us. You'll have more time. I really believe that. Your talents will be used in incredible ways. And the produce, the things that you do work for, hard for, it's because God gave you the ability. And your table looks so much different than God's. And he set it up this way. Would you stand with me? Would you be so kind? We just have a few moments together. and Would you be so kind to bow your head with me just as a moment of reverence for each other? And as you've bowed your head, listen. Discovering that God owns it all is a lifelong discovery process. It doesn't happen in one day or one night, but it's a journey that we each take. But the one thing I've discovered 
And declaring that God owns it all, I first have to say, God, I'm gonna let you own my life. You might be here today and you've never given God the opportunity to own your life. It begins with a solemn relationship, a declaration that you say in your heart that says, God, I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross for me, to pay the price for everything I would ever do wrong. And he conquered death and he rose from the grave. And because he did that, I can be in your kingdom. I can be a son and daughter adopted by you. Have you let God own your life? It begins there. So as every head is bowed, if today you need to allow God into your life, Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, if you need him to own the stuff in your life, I'm telling you the freedom that comes with it and the joy that comes with it is amazing. If that's you today, I'm gonna simply ask that you'd raise your hand so I can pray for you today. Anyone in this room, anyone here? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna pray a prayer together. And I want us to pray this prayer and it's just gotta come from your heart. And when you pray it from your heart, I'm telling you, you're saying, God, you're the owner of everything in my life. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my past. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I commit my life to you. I ask that you own everything. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on now, if you just prayed that prayer, there's a party going on in heaven for you right now. Now I want to speak to us as a family of believers, Christians. Christian, I'm on the journey to live this out. And I have learned that as I put God first and I recognize that he owns it all, I have seen my life start to look this way. And it's a journey. And I don't know, Christian, where you are in that journey. But what if today we said, God, would you help me take another step in the journey? One more step towards the beauty of this kind of a life. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you and let's, let's take that next step, Christian. Father in heaven, right now, I pray for us as believers, as Christians, as followers of God, that we would begin to take another step today in the journey. That we'd put you first and we'd recognize how much, God, you've allowed us to be blessed with in life from our time and our talent and our treasure. God, we declare once again that you own it all. And so, God, we pray that we will live our lives in such a way that shows the world, shows our loved ones, and shows ourselves that you own it all. And Father in heaven, I pray for everyone here within the sound of my voice. I pray that your face shine upon them, give them peace, give them rest. Lord, I pray for their homes, their businesses, their places of work. Be filled with your presence. Lord, I pray for their finances, that they'll have everything they need, and in turn, they'll live out lives of generosity. Lord, I pray for their children and their grandchildren, that they'll walk in your goodness and walk in your favor all the days of their life. And God, as may we leave this place declaring you're the owner of it all. In Jesus' name, we say amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. We'll see you back here next week.